Welcome to everybody to the Crypto Policy Symposium. In this session, we will be looking at the question, are regulations and regulators fit to meet the crypto challenge, particularly from a Northern American perspective? My name is Dr. Ruth Vantöfer. I've been uh, working in the field of innovative technologies for several years and also researched the crypto specifically space uh, with a PhD myself. And I'm here to welcome Stephen Diamond, Associate Professor of Law at Santa Clara University School of Law, as well as John Reed Stark, President of the John Reed Stark Consultation Consulting LLC. Professor Diamond has actually a really interesting background with law firms, working with startups and venture capital in Silicon Valley. Um, he's a lawyer and a political scientist and has a JD from Yale Law School, as well as a PhD from the University of London and is also the recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship in International Peace and Security. He has served on boards of startup companies as well as publicly traded companies and regularly advises founders of companies on corporate governance finance and is also an expert witness and consultant on a wide range of business litigation matters. His research spans business law, securities regulation, corporate finance and globalization. And more recently, his research focuses on stock market structure insider trading and corporate governance. John Reed Stark um, has actually a massive background in regulatory affairs. Um, he is currently the president of Stark Consulting, a data breach response and digital compliance firm, but he has served for almost 20 years at the enforcement division of the US Securities and Exchange Commission. And the last 11 years in that role, he's been the chief of its office of internet enforcement, which is particularly interesting for our discussion. He currently teaches cyber law uh, as a senior lecturer fellow at the Duke University Law School, and he's also worked for 15 years as adjunct professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center, covering law, technology, and crime, and how it's all connected. Previously to that, he worked in a global data breach response firm as managing director and also head up their offices in Washington. And he's the author of the Cybersecurity due diligence handbook for anybody who hasn't bought it yet, <laughs> off you go, but maybe after this session. So I'd like to start uh, by giving our audience a bit of a background, particularly around the regulatory landscape in the US as it pertains to crypto and how crypto is really being looked at by regulators in, in the US. And maybe we start off with Professor Diamond because you're teaching this regularly as far as I'm aware. So off to you. Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Ruth, and uh, welcome to the audience uh, for this uh, important and innovative uh, conference, one of the first efforts by a group of independent uh, figures to assess the impact of this uh, phenomenon known as crypto, which is a kind of umbrella term for us today. Obviously, we're talking about a wide range of digital assets. Um, these are markets now that are emerging for millions of uh, retail uh, investors. And from, as you say, North American perspective, unfortunately, this would probably be primarily an American or US perspective, but given the size of the US capital markets, US financial markets, uh, and of course, the role of where I live, Silicon Valley, in promoting this sector, I think that's a reasonable uh, contribution to the debate. Um, the concern here, I think, generally speaking for regulators is uh, that if you begin to steer people's personal savings into markets that are not appropriately regulated, uh, you lose a tremendous amount of transparency and accountability over how people's uh, hard-earned savings are being deployed. And as we've seen in the last, just in the last year, uh, a massive sell-off, a crash, uh, in, these, uh, in these cyber markets, uh, people are being hurt. And that has, of course, triggered enormous concern across the political spectrum, as it should. Um, my own view is, when I take a look at the existing framework of our securities laws, that we have very robust uh, regulatory uh, framework in place. Uh, this, is, this is not the first rodeo uh, for regulators when it comes to a financial crisis. Uh, and as you uh, pointed out, I mean, if we go back to 1929, this is when the original framework uh, for the modern securities laws were put into place. Um, we saw a phenomenon that has a lot of echoes in today's crypto markets. That is very sophisticated uh, insiders playing with other people's money and often losing it. 
And that led to the establishment of the federal securities law regime, uh, which of course today is uh, implemented by the Securities and Exchange Commission, which John of course was a part of for many years. Uh, and the core principle of course is that when you're playing with other people's money, uh, you have a certain kind of social responsibility. Uh, and the framework for imposing that social responsibility is triggered by the definition of what is a security or what is a commodity in, in the case of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And by the way, the antecedent of the current Commodity Exchange Act, Grain Futures Act was in place for many years and then was modernized also in the 1930s and it's been updated more recently to give the CFTC some additional regulatory authority. But broadly speaking in the securities markets, when you're investing or looking for seeking the investment of other people's money, then you have certain responsibility to provide them with the information, the disclosure that they need in order to make a rational investment decision. And I think that core principle applies to the crypto markets broadly. Absolutely. And I think the SEC has agreed with that and is aggressively pursuing an agenda to ensure that investors are protected. I'm sorry, Ruth, you're still on mute. <laughs> That's a classic rookie mistake. <laughs> uh, John, do you want to add anything to that, maybe, as an overview? Well, for, well, first, I want to thank you, Ruth, for being here. And it's a privilege to be with Stephen. Thank you to Stephen Deal and, and Martin for putting this together, this symposium of Crypto Nights. There's never been anything like it. I, I can't believe I'm a part of it. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of wish I'd had Stephen in law school, though I had a terrific securities law professor because he explained it in a very commonsensical way. It's not that complicated, Ruth. When you give somebody your money and they're supposed to do something with it so that you can make some more money, that's a security. And there's extra protections are put in there for a reason, because after 1929, Congress established the, the 33 Act, the 34 Act, the 40 Act, all these different securities regulation frameworks that essentially said when it comes to investing, there's some special protections here. And it, it lawyers love to overcomplicate this. Again, I, I, what, whatever it is, the, the definition of security typically covers it. And it was meant to cover things that were not anticipated at the time. That's what's so amazing about some of the defenses I hear that, well, this law is archaic. No, it's not. The Supreme Court uh, has looked at the Howey test and, the, and all of the securities regulation and said, this is supposed to be broad. It's supposed to cover things. When I was at the SEC, we, we brought cases against eel farms, ostrich farms, muni bond far fraud, derivatives fraud, insider trading fraud. E everything is uh, covered by these securities laws, but without specific prescription. And you know, there were these cases I brought uh, that, that I, I worked on and our team worked on called uh, these bogus instruments called prime bank securities. And they purported to represent a secondary market for standby letters of credit. It was a big mouthful. This was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And their big, big pitch was, we're outside the, the regulatory framework. And they conned a lot of people into investing into these prime bank notes, prime bank securities, whatever they called them, prime bank uh, debenture instruments. And the Chicago Housing Authority bought millions of dollars worth. And the SEC sued the entity that pitched those prime bank notes. And the prime bank, the defense was, these are not securities and they were complete fiction. Since they're a complete fiction, they can't possibly be securities. Well, the, the circuit court, as it went to appeal, uh, went in favor of the SEC there and said, well, if these prime bank instruments were not fiction and were what they purported to be, then they would be securities. So that's how broad securities regulation is meant to be. So this idea that it's a complex vertical commonality and horizontal commonality, yes, there's all sorts of laws talking about this. But with respect to crypto, it's basic stuff. It's not complicated. People have been writing about it for close to a century. And I think it's a really good point that you're calling this out because it's all about principle-based policy and regulation. And we have the same debates in Europe where I've spent many times lobbying regulators because actually if the principle is right, it will stand the test of time and it will withstand any technology change, which is really not the particular piece to put forward because everything can always change in the underlying, but the principle is the same. Um, 
Now, if we go into the more key risks of crypto from a regulatory perspective, clearly the first thing that jumps out when we look at the principles that Stephen so clearly um, highlighted is consumer protection, right? You entrust somebody with your asset and you, you want it not to be lost and not to be diminishing unduly. So, so would you like to just elaborate a little bit more on what are really the key risks from a regulated perspective that we see today? And I'm very aware they keep changing. <laughs> uh, you know, I can start, Stephen, and you can kick in because I'm sure we could spend the whole 45 minutes about it. I mean, the lack of regulatory oversight, lack of consumer protections, lack of any audit inspection or examination function of what's going on at these financial firms. Uh, lack of licensure of the individuals involved, lack of net capital requirements, lack of insurance. And overall, there's no transparency in the lack of cybersecurity standards. Just about all of these regulations were put in place so that when you pick up the phone and you order your, your 100 shares of Microsoft, or you click in and order 100 shares of Microsoft, or you're on your phone and you buy 100 shares of Microsoft, that that transaction is pretty much going to happen. And that if it doesn't happen, then there's a compliance function. There's all sorts of technology and people that can immediately take action. You know, I, I teach this course at Duke Law School and the students play a law firm. They play partners in a law firm who are defending a company that has just experienced a cyber attack. And that company is a financial firm. And one of the exercises we have is I bring someone in from the SEC and someone from FINRA in, real people from those places, at the Financial Regulatory Authority and the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the students have to report the incident to them. And right away, the, the SEC says things like, okay, we're sending an inspection team over there tomorrow. We wanna to talk to all the witnesses. We wanna see forensic reports. We wanna know about uh, the entire incident, what you're doing. We wanna see every communication. The FINRA person says, we wanna know everything you're telling your customers. We wanna know if a single nickel from a customer has been lost. We wanna know what you're doing to remediate the situation. And the students are kind of look at this and say, well, we don't wanna let you. Well, that's not the right answer because you don't have a choice when the, your regulator, you don't fight with your regulator, you could be put out of business overnight. I'll, I'll turn it over to Stephen to, I'm sure there's there's some things that I'm, I might've forgotten in that laundry list. Well, that's an you know excellent case study for how, for how to attack this problem and how to expose some of the issues that you face in the real world. Uh, at the heart of this, we want to enable investors, at least we're gonna to continue to have a capitalist system that functions uh, efficiently we want to enable investors to, to balance risk and return. Now to balance risk and return, what's critical is information. It, 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 if you want to talk about the core principles of the securities markets, let's go back to Louis Brandeis in the early part of the 20th century. He wrote a famous series of articles in the Atlantic Magazine that later publishes the book, Other People's Money and How Wall Street Bankers Use It. Now, other people's money is the heart of this entire environment. And we've had a kind of retail investor capitalism in this country since the late 19th century, 150 years. Uh, if we don't have a system for regulating how other people's money is used, the system falls apart. Uh, economists call this a lemons problem. If you can't trust your counterparts uh, in these markets, and that's true of whether we define some aspect or some slice of the crypto market as a commodity, or as a security, right? We can discuss, for example, the ongoing debate about the CFTC versus the SEC, but in both those markets, there's concern about transparency and understanding the balance between risk and return. In my view, for example, the SEC's disclosure requirements, the securities laws mandate disclosure once you offer or sell a, sell a security, unless you have an exemption. And even then there's some minimal amount of disclosure. Um, but if you don't have an exemption, then you file a registration statement with the SEC. So when you do an IPO, you file something called a registration statement on Form S-1. In my class, we bring together teams of bankers and company officials to negotiate the content of a registration statement on Form S-1. And the students learn why it's so important, right? Why you need that, right? Investment banks cannot sell securities to investors if they don't have a good understanding of the nature of the business. Right. And so what the SEC is really one of the things that really fantastic about is probing whether or not these documents describe for investors what they need to know to make a decision. It does is the material information, information that's important to a reasonable investor. 
present in the document? Background of the executive team. Do they have the business expertise? Some explanation of what you're going to do of how the technology works. These are two areas that I would like to highlight if we have any regulators uh, listening today, right? About why the SEC to me is a natural regulator here, which is information about the management teams that are running these coin offerings and these coin operations and these token operations and these exchanges, the crypto exchange. Who are these people? What are their backgrounds? Tell us. And then number two, right? What is their business plan? What is their strategy? What is their financial condition? All of these things get wrapped up into the disclosure regime, the mandatory disclosure regime that's triggered once you offer or sell a security. Uh, and so I think this is what has to be brought to the fore uh, when we're talking about sort of substance as opposed to the, um, I don't really know what to call the game that's going on in Washington right now with politicians to kind of play a kind of, uh, kind of cast a, a, a kind of cloud of confusion over the regulatory environment. Uh, it's, as again, I would agree with John, it's relatively straightforward. And look at the categories, Stephen. You know, you, you, you have the Division of Corporation Finance, and they regulate all these public companies and look at all those filings, not as a matter of quality, but do they, do they say what they're supposed to say? And are they saying it in the correct fashion? And are they complete? And are they a fair and accurate depiction of what's going on at that company? And then you have outside auditors who issue reports quarterly and you get audited financial statements that are signed off annually. That's the public company side. Then the entity side, which is the, the exchange, the platform, the broker, which in this case would be the crypto exchange or the, the, the pitch person of the, the, or the um, digital wallet. All of those entities fall under the umbrella of the SEC. They're also not only registered with the SEC, but they're subject to this inspection, examination, and auditing by the division of examinations. And then there's a division of enforcement, which if you don't comply with any of those people, they refer it over to the division of enforcement, who then can go emer to an emergency action to court. They can proceed administratively. So there's all kinds of protections in place for people. And it pretty much works. There have been failures. Everyone loves to say, oh, the, the subprime crisis or the Enron crisis. There, there, of course, have been horrendous failures. But by and large, it pretty much works. So, so exactly leading on from that, I think there has been a bit of the myth for many years that starting with Bitcoin is fully decentralized. It's something you can do behind the regulators and the government's back. It's pseudonymous. It's incredibly hard to trace. Over time, we've seen what I would call the greed of centralization coming in more and more. And I'm actually just writing a book about decentralization because I think we have too much centralization in certain senses. But we've seen actually that there are a number of nodes which you can actually refer to and pinpoint to understand who is in charge of what. And of course, we've seen the on and off ramp ecosystem very clearly to be the one where, first of all, anti-money laundering rules started applying, et cetera. But what, what do you feel are still the challenges for the legal system in dealing with crypto if we think about the sort of really more private crypto space, which is still which still has elements of decentralization? And certainly it has elements of very bad governance, because just echoing what both of you said, this was all a message around corporate governance. You don't need to behave like a listed company, but you have to have the right governance in place, which covers everything you do in the firm. And that is something that is just good business, how to do good business. And most of these businesses initially were set up, of course, to do more clandestine things potentially. But but maybe uh, maybe over to, to John initially and, and, and then Stephen on what, what are the challenges for the legal system still with that space? Oh, there, there are lots of challenges. I mean, the whole point, look, there are at least a dozen or so anti-money laundering statutes in the U.S., and they all basically say, we don't want any kind of terrorist to get some sort of bank account or some sort of financial account. And we're going to do lots of due diligence before these accounts are allowed to get started. And we're going to have all kinds of safeguards and guardrails in place, like suspicious activity reports from a bank teller or from a brokerage house. And all of those things are meant to surveil financial transactions in the U.S. And that's codified by law. And so this notion that, and I, I've heard certain politicians get up and talk like this, and I, I don't want to be partisan because I don't think this is a partisan issue. The laws are already on the books saying that you don't have that sort of privacy. 
People have decided in the US that we're not going to have secretive banking laws that allow for secret transactions. I appreciate someone might want that, okay? And they should lobby their congressman or whomever, congressperson or whomever to make that happen. But that's not the way the law is right now. So this notion that you can, and, and what happens when you have this anonymity are this these litany of just awful externalities. You know, from, from ransomware attacks, but for Bitcoin, there would be no ransomware attacks. And I'm a ransomware expert. I've been helping companies manage ransomware attacks essentially since they first started. And there would be no ransomware attacks. And, and people never get their money back. Maybe once or twice in history have they found the, the, the actual ransomware attacker and have they actually recovered the ransomware payment. Most entities pay, most of them never get their money back. Most ransomware attackers never get caught. But then you could also talk human sex trafficking, child pornography, drug dealing, sanctions evasion, terrorism. These are all, these, these, these crimes, it's all been heavily substantiated, are all getting, are all occurring a lot more because of cryptocurrency, because of the pseudo anonymity that cryptocurrency creates. So it creates enormous challenges for law, law enforcement. And, and for what, Ruth? For what, Stephen? What, what are we doing all this for so that people can, can, so that they can fall victim to Celsius or Voyager or Terra or Third Arrow or all these entities and wake up one morning and they're an unsecured creditor? They're thinking, wait, I want my Bitcoin back or I want my crypto back. Sorry, the terms of service don't allow for that. And you just suddenly get shut out. When was the last time you got shut out of your bank account or your brokerage account? It doesn't happen, okay, on rare occasions. And when it does, you can bet the SEC sends an army to that entity. So that's my question, Ruth, and, and I, I'm not asking Stephen to answer it because it's rhetorical. For what? Just so a bunch, we have all this, so a bunch of criminals, can, can their jobs can get a lot easier? So, so just to summarize, the regulations are clear and principle-based, and I would echo exactly the same in Europe and other markets. Um, what, what some providers are doing is not right. Uh, and in fact, they're reinforcing the bad in human nature. Um, do we have a challenge of finding them? Is, is that the sort of enforcement challenge more than anything? Or do we feel that the regulatory regime and how we're approaching it is effective? Because I um, absolutely agree with you. All the issues that this triggers are all terribly bad and get worse. But how, how do we feel about whether the regulatory system is fit for purpose to tackle those challenges? Stephen, do you want to? Uh, well, John's a 20-year veteran of the Division of Enforcement. I would defer to him on the investigatory resources available to the federal government when it wants to, wants to find out who's behind any particular transaction. But I think it's fair to assume that if the US government wants to know who's carrying out a fraudulent transaction on any aspect of the World Wide Web, it can get there. Uh, the tornado cash North Korean example comes to mind, uh, as do the actions against Tether by both the CFTC and New York State enforcement authorities. So I think there are investigatory tools available. Uh, and my guess is that anybody who thinks they can hide on the internet is kidding themselves. The question is whether there are the resources available on any given day, the priority in government to pursue this and the political will. Um, but uh, I, I do want to at least quibble with the idea that there are some uh, player bad actors in this sector of Ruth, if that's what you're suggesting. I think uh, my guess is a substantial portion of the assets in this sector are for nefarious purposes. I believe this sector was set up to enable those nefarious purposes. There are only really two sources uh, for this. Number one, really bad actors like John lays out. And number two, uh, a, a, a kind of a perverse version of libertarianism, right? So when I first started looking at this sector five or six years ago, uh, you know, I put up on my blog at the time, uh, you know, bit, uh, uh, Bitcoin is an ideology, not a technology. And I think that's essential to understand what's going on here. At best, this is a kind of Friedrich Hayek kind of libertarian uh, foolishness that we can get by without government. We can have some kind of pure, you know, distributed leisure technology society. Uh, I think that's terribly naive about how even Bitcoin itself functions. And I think there's even a case to be made that Bitcoin is a security. 
It's a project, it's an enterprise, it's controlled by the miners. Uh, we don't know who these miners are, that is, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I, I think there are people within the, uh, the, the intelligence community who know exactly who they are, I'm sure. Uh, whether we want the SEC to pursue them or not is really really the question, uh, and or the Department of Justice. Um, but I, So I think, number one, we should just uh, stop kidding ourselves about the nefarious nature of what's going on here. That's the starting point, okay? So we've built a financial system on top of uh, a socially irresponsible and criminal network. And we have now lured millions of Americans into that system on the pretense that they're going to join Sam Bankman Freed in something called effective altruism. And unfortunately, this has now leaked into even the Democratic Party, where you're seeing people on the left of the spectrum concerned that, you know, this, they don't want to be left behind by this wealth creation machinery. And you see this sort of um, uh, almost giant sucking sound of political interest uh, animating this. And I think this is made, this is probably the explanatory variable with, that has made uh, genuine, uh, you know, regulatory oversight challenging for the agencies, whether it's CFTC, SEC, FDIC, et cetera. That is within the political spectrum, this is nuance. There are, there are left-wing Democrats who are supporting this stuff. And I think that's a real problem, uh, right? They've lost sight of what's going on here. Now, I hope this crypto crash and crypto winter and rising interest rates uh, sucks the, uh, the energy out of this system and, 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 and allows us some time, frankly, to, uh, to have the kind of conversation we're having in this conference. Um, but I just think it's, 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 it's just naive to think that this is anything other than what it started as, which is essentially an outside the law enterprise, right, with, an, with a political goal. Uh, and uh, it, it's having the effect that I think its founders wanted to have, whoever they are. And I think they Absolutely. ought to be found and talked to. <laughs> Absolutely, Stephen. You know, it, it, if you look at, people love to, to criticize the SEC, you know, and, and I'm one of those people who love criticizing the SEC. I wrote a big op-ed piece criticizing, in the Wall Street Journal criticizing the SEC. And I've been very critical, but in the area of crypto, I am not critical because the SEC has actually done quite a bit during the evolution, which has happened so quickly. So let's start with the initial coin offerings. I'll run through real quick. ICOs, right? Just laughable. They were absolutely a security in 2017, 2018. The SEC started uh, bringing some, some actions in the area, making lots of pronouncements, and it essentially cleared out the mess that were ICOs. So what happened next? SAFs, S-A-F-Ts. Uh, somehow these future tokens were not going to be securities. That was ridiculous. So the SEC started suing there. And the SEC did something extraordinary. They sued Telegram in federal court in an emergency action without alleging fraud. Now, I have brought lots of TROs. I consider myself a bit of an SEC historian. I don't remember a single emergency action the SEC has ever brought in history that didn't involve some fraud, because remember, it's an ex parte proceeding. That means the other side is not there. It's you and the judge. And you just say, hey, they're doing some bad stuff. We need to shut them down. And they don't even, they're not even entitled to a hearing until 10 days from now. And the SEC won that relief in Telegram. Tele they Telegram fought, of course, like Stephen says, these companies are incredibly well capitalized. That's the difference between prime bank fraud, microcap fraud, and eel farms and ostrich farms and other kinds of cases that we brought back in the 90s and the early 2000s. So then you went from SAF, so the SEC shut those down. Then they started these lending programs, and the SEC sued BlockFi and won that case with a settlement where they got every single bit of relief they wanted, plus BlockFi paid a $100 million penalty. That's a very large penalty at the SEC. And... BlockFi somehow celebrated that. This is the upside down world of crypto as a fantastic time because now they could be registered and do everything right. Well, guess what? The SEC saved a lot of investors in BlockFi. Then they submitted a Wells notice. What's a Wells notice? That's when you tell a company, hey, we're about to sue you. Tell us why we shouldn't sue you. That's what they did to Coinbase when Coinbase was marketing the heck out of this Lend product that, that was just like Celsius's and just like BlockFi's. And the SEC served the Wells notice. What did Coinbase do? They went online that night and called the SEC sketchy, 
and, and started screaming and yelling that they were being treated unfairly. The SEC, of course, couldn't respond because all investigations are non-public, but very quickly, Coinbase settled, stopped doing the lending program. So the SEC has brought over 100 cases, and this is studied in a company called Cornerstone, does a study every year in the crypto space. So the SEC has brought cases like the ICO, the SAP cases, the, the lending cases, and, and I think been very effective in this area. And I think the next wave are the exchanges. I think they are going to get hit. I think, in my opinion, that Coinbase is going to get sued for some of its Exchange Act work, some of its exchange work and its broker dealer work. And uh, the question to me is, is, are those charges going to involve fraud? But no one knows because all of these investigations are non-public. So when you talk, Ruth, about regulatory um, efficiency and efficacy and all of these things, I, I got to hand it to the SEC in this situation because they've been very aggressive under both Republican and Democratic administrations. And for that, I, I don't think anybody should be critical of them. And they're building a bigger crypto unit. They're going to name a new crypto chief anytime. They got 20 new spots. The only agency that's going to do more, Ruth, is the IRS, because they're going to take this 80 billion and they're going to sue the heck out of every single person who traded more than $20,000 worth of crypto in the last decade. So get ready for that. Yeah, that's a good call out. And I think building on that, just in my mind, we obviously have quite a strong crypto lobby by now because a lot of people made a lot of money, not in the right way necessarily. Um, and more recently or increasingly, we do see the crypto industry's requests for regulatory clarity. You already alluded to the fact that when certain cases actually get to a conclusion and the SEC is actually one Sometimes those companies position it as a win for themselves, even though they may have something called regulatory clarity and can, can continue working. But what is sort of your perspective on these industry requests? Is it an attempt to actually get onto a safe footing and, and do the right thing? Or is it more like a way to legitimize what they sort of still do? Because we are clearly continuously on a learning curve as to what else may they do wrong, uh, because it sort of happens in waves, I guess. But a few views on both, from both of you on that. Well, with respect to this this phrase, regulatory clarity, I, I think the uh, you know an Oscar should go to uh, what <laughs> invented uh, that term because it's 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 fit for purpose, right? It's it's an attempt essentially to uh, distract people from the fact that, as John and, and I've made clear, right? It's there is regulatory clarity there. It's fairly straightforward. It's been in place for a very, very long time. It gets it, the concept of a security gets at the heart of what goes on in financial markets. Um, securities regulation has been around since the 18th century. Uh, we can go back to the Bubble Act of 1720 uh, if we want to uh, with respect to this. So, um, you know, that's a misnomer. Uh, and, and, uh, but you're absolutely right to highlight the fact that there is now a massive lobbying effort. Millions of dollars are being spent. We just learned in the last couple of days that Sam Bankman-Fried led a team of advisors into the Biden White House in May and met for several days with advisors at the White House. Uh, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, of course, is, is a multi-billionaire uh, uh, founder of one of the major uh, exchanges. Uh, and um, you're seeing for better or worse, you're seeing uh, key figures in the regulatory industry now join forces, right? So we have uh, the former chairman of the SEC, Jay Clayton, just, just joined a, a venture fund dedicated to the crypto space. The head of the division of corporate finance from the, uh, the uh, Trump administration is at Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the large venture capital funds pouring money into this space, has raised billions of dollars for this space. Um, and it's interesting, they're turning their crypto into dollar, fiat dollars in order to pour that money into the lobbying effort that they're, that's underway uh, in Congress. Um, I think it's probably a good thing uh, that at least for this Congress, there will not be any attempt to carve back uh, the authority of the SEC. Keep in mind how it works in the United States, right? As John and I have described, we go, we're going back to the 1933 Act. The 1933 Act was an act of Congress. Congress legislates, legislates. When it legislated, it set up the SEC in 1934 to administer the 33 Act. And, and the Supreme Court then interprets, and, and through the court system, we interpret the various uh, regulations that the SEC enacts. 
Um, and it's out of that process that we got the definition of the security that we're talking about today. Congress could speak again and attempt to carve that back. And, and that's what's happening with some of the proposals. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to me that they're going to get anywhere, at least in this session. Right. Uh, and even though I've made some critical comments here about the left wing, the Democratic Party, my guess is if the Democrats uh, hold on to the House and Senate, uh, that there won't be any dramatic shift uh, to redefine uh, this very stable understanding of the financial markets. But I do think there is a political battle underway uh, for the hearts and minds of Congress, if you will, and it is being heavily funded as um, some of the elite within the crypto world turn their digital assets into fiat currency and then use fiat currency to engage in right. heavily. Yeah, I mean, let's name some names here. You know, this idea of regulation by enforcement is a tired and old and ridiculous pivot. You know, I think Gary Gensler, the chair of the SEC, said, I, I don't call it regulation by enforcement. I call it enforcement. You know, I said before, insider trading fraud, derivatives trading fraud, uh, offering frauds, muni bond fraud, subprime fraud. Everything is covered by the securities laws that just say, essentially, you can't lie, cheat and steal. And, you know, Caroline Pham, the C CFT commissioner, Caroline Pham, SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, the famed crypto mom, they are constantly, constantly, they're constantly saying, oh, this is regulation by enforcement, but it's just enforcement. And, you know, and it, it, it's maddening that from within, that people from within can be so misleading in what they're saying. And yeah. for whatever, I, I don't know how they've been captured, but they've been captured. And I really think it's a shame and I look at, but but there's a lot of heroes, Ruth. You know, you look at the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. They came out and said, look, hey, any financial firm that wants to do business with crypto, they got to get permission from us first. The FDIC has issued a bunch of letters to a series of exchanges saying you represented that the FDI, that there was FDIC insurance associated with these investments from customers. And that was not true. And you better stop doing yet that. Now, I don't know where the Department of Justice is because I'll criticize them because those to me are criminal cases. Anybody who represents that there's FDIC insurance when there isn't should go to prison because yes. that's the kind of thing that misleads people. And, and finally, the Department of Labor that has this unique carved out SEC-like jurisdiction over retirement monies. And the Department of Labor, a real champion there, another unsung hero just came out and said, look, I don't think any retiree should ever be investing in crypto and just said, if any fiduciary in the crypto, in the retirement ecosystem of investing recommends crypto, then that is essentially a per se violation of their fiduciary duty. So there's plenty of government activity going on. And as I mentioned before, the IRS and FinCEN in, in the next two years, in the next, in 2024, two big things are going to happen. Any exchange that does any business with anyone is going to have to submit 1099 reports about the crypto transactions, just like broker dealers do that. So don't think about evading your taxes. And any entity that starts accepting crypto is going to have to give similar reports. And FinCEN is going to change their rule, which says that if you have money outside of the US, in more than 10,000 in cash in the aggregate, you have to report that on an FBAR form. Otherwise, you risk going to prison for five years. That's going to apply to crypto. FinCEN had said that. So there's a lot in the pipeline here, Ruth, that's going to, to really be meaningful. But I think, I think we, if I could just, Ruth, I was just going to say, there, it, sorry, uh, if it, uh, I think what John has laid out there in, de in great detail points to what I think has been a kind of pivot. That is, once, the, uh, once President Biden issued his executive order, uh, uh, which uh, that, that sent a green light across the uh, administrative state that uh, there would be a whole of government approach here. So I think these heroes are emerging because they have been uh, you know, given that green light to use the tools that you have in your agencies to understand this issue and uh, pay attention to its impact on your constituencies. So when it comes, for example, to uh, Taft-Hartley funds, pension funds, hundreds of billions of dollars that are regulated by the Department of Labor under ERISA, the Employment Retiree uh, Income Security Act, that happens to be one area where, unfortunately, the Supreme Court carved those out of the securities laws. In a famous case that I, that I teach in my, my uh, course, I'm sure uh, John is familiar with IBTV Daniel, 
Uh, so the Department of Labor has this very important role in regulating the retirement assets uh, of millions of Americans. Uh, and uh, so the, there's a there's a question here of the fundamental integrity of our financial system, of the stability of the dollar, uh, of financial assets. Uh, and to that extent, I think the Biden order is very important. And we're going to see now reports coming back to the executive branch, to the White House, from the agency, the array of agencies that, that John has been describing, uh, detailing what they're doing in response to this environment. And I think what's going on essentially is this lobbying effort, Ruth, you rightly pointed to, is playing a, they're on, they appear to be aggressive and, and leading the charge, but in a sense, I think they're on a back step. They're, 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 they're responding defensively because the market has crashed, number one, and they're seeing what can happen when the government decides to take real leadership as it has to protect uh, our financial markets. Thank you. And I think I just wanted to triangulate two points. One that you just mentioned earlier, Stephen, that the system has the effect that it was intended to have, which in my view is to control people. I think that's something that we really need to keep in mind. And I agree right now the market has crashed. If the market suddenly goes back up again, it will be more effective at that. And back to you, John, uh, clearly a regulation is not worth the papers written on if you don't enforce it. <laughs> so I'm absolutely all for enforcement because otherwise everything is just lip service. So it sounds to me if we summarize the regulator stance at this stage and the nature of regulations, it is fit for purpose. Yes, of course, you could always have more staffing in regulatory agencies and more yes. education uh, and, and more, more funding to make it work. But there is certainly a concerning element if you have some in your ranks that are still um, suggesting otherwise, as you've just outlined, John, earlier. And I think that is an important thing to watch. Now, maybe as a last uh, brief question, do you think there's any need for changing primary reg legislation or regulations? Um, or, or do you feel that with what we have on paper and the enforcement models we have, if we had more funding, and certainly if the politics doesn't pivot into the wrong direction, we are good to stay that way? Or, or is there anything else you would, would like to change or improve from that perspective. Stephen, you, you can Yeah, start. well, I, look, I would just point back to the fundamental core here of the regulatory structure. The Securities Act of 1933 has both an enumerated list of financial instruments that count as securities essentially automatically. There's some, you know, around the edges, some trimming that the courts have done over time. And then has a catch-all category known as investment contracts, which is at the heart of what we've been talking about for the most part. Um, uh, the Supreme Court actually embodied in the Howey test in 1946, a slightly more stringent uh, bar, uh, more a higher bar, if you will, than the SEC itself wanted, or wanted even a more broader approach than the, uh, it's the original test. Um, but that, that core concept of investment contract, what is its purpose? Its purpose is to ensure that uh, uh, entrepreneurs do not attempt to kind of unbundle what would otherwise be a security and pass it off around the regulatory structure uh, such that it lures money into their ventures without abiding by the securities laws. So it is there as a fundamental protective feature. That's the core principle. That, that is fit for purpose, uh, most definitely. And it, then, of course, it's a question of, of resources and training and education uh, to ensure that the system actually works. Um, but if we stay focused on that core principle, uh, then we can probably get our hands around this. I will just, just note finally, it is challenging for any administrative agency to get its, hand, its hands around essentially what is a mania. And we are in the midst of what Charles Kindleberger, the late great uh, economic historian called in his book, manias, panics, and crashes, right? We have had a mania phase. We've had a panic phase. Now we're in a crash phase. Regulation often follows those circumstances. Um, but we have regulation in place, and I think there's now a chance to, to, uh, for the SEC and other agencies to ensure uh, that the wider public and entrepreneurial uh, uh, innovators are aware of what their responsibilities are. You know, Ruth, to me, fraud is fraud, whether you're doing it in the metaverse or whether you're doing it in an old Wall Street building or whether you're doing it in some bucket shop out on Long Island in New York and, and stealing from people. And the securities law's basic premise, I mentioned before, is you don't lie, cheat, and steal. 
in connection with people's money. That's securities fraud. And the things that I want to see happen really aren't at all having to do with um, statutes. And this was the same thing when I was chief. I was chief for 11 years and there was lots of talk then, oh, you know, you're, you're stifling technology. No, we weren't stifling technology. We were getting the bad actors out of the way so that the technology could flourish. When I was chief, I considered myself an internet evangelist. I traveled the country talking about how amazing it was. Not so with crypto because there's no good in it. So given that there's no good in it, I, it's you're not stifling innovation by stopping crypto. You're stifling crime and, and chicanery and fraud and thievery and robbing from innocent people. Read the Celsius bankruptcy filings if you want to read some awful, horrible uh, investor stories. These four things, I'll run through them real quick. I mentioned FinCEN changing that $10,000. They said they were going to do that in, I think it was December 31st, 2020. They haven't done it yet. FinCEN, uh, the financial... Crimes Enforcement Network of the Department of Treasury needs to change that because anybody who has more than $10,000 in crypto outside of the US should be treated the same as anybody with 10,000 in cash. That's gonna happen soon, but not soon enough as far as I'm concerned. I don't know where they are, what they're doing. They said they were gonna do this and they haven't. Second is DOJ prosecutions. People need to go to jail. They're not really afraid of the SEC. In fact, they'll, they'll go online and call the SEC names. They won't call the Department of Justice names when they're behind bars. Trust me, I know that. I, I taught at the FBI Academy, and most of the cases we brought had a joint criminal pro parallel prosecution to them. And when you go to jail or you're under the threat of going to jail, you stop pointing fingers at everybody. Next is the IRS using these John Doe subpoenas. They've been incredibly effective, and the courts are all over them. What's a John Doe subpoena? Well, it's when the IRS sends a, a request to Coinbase and says, tell me every single person over the last five years who made more than $20,000 trading and give me all of their information. And guess what? Coinbase has to comply. If you read the petitions that have succeeded in the courts, the IRS has extraordinary empirical information that people who own crypto are not paying their taxes. Just based on the number of transactions that a place like Coinbase says has happened and the number of taxes that are being paid. And, and fourth, I think, you know, in the Infrastructure Act, tucked in there was this idea of 1099 form, reports from exchanges, reports from retailers about transactions. Once all of this sunlight is brought in on this trading, it's just going to be shooting fish in a barrel for federal law enforcement. Well, I think ideally, I was going to say, just ideally, we view the securities laws as what uh, one of the early chairman of the SEC, William O'Douglas, sure. later, of course, in court justice said, the securities law should function like a well-oiled shotgun sitting in the corner of the room. And it is, we should not have to use it. But John is pointing out that from time to time, you do have to pull out the heavy guns by enforcement and uh, to remind people the laws exist, right? And again, unfortunately, I don't think it gets enough attention, but we have to keep in mind the scale and scope of the bad actors who are who built this system and are profiting by it at the expense of ordinary uh, investors. And I would, of course, commend to your view our viewers today. You're listening to two, you know, regulators and securities law uh, uh, nuts, right? But you want to look across at the other part of the conference where you will see a great deal of discussion about what we've been alluding to, which is there is no use case for this. Right. This this is this is, uh, you know, a fantasy that's been built up to essentially lure investors hard earned cash away from the financial markets where there are legitimate businesses in operation. In other words, it's raising the cost of capital, if you will. It's siphoning good capital out of uh, the core financial markets. And that that is a critical problem here. Thank you, gentlemen. I think in a, in a very clear nutshell, when we reflect on the US regulatory system and what regulators have done across the board, we see that regulations are effective, that regulators have done their best. A lot of it has been by its nature enforcement because things are going wrong and regulations therefore have to be applied in such a way. And ultimately, this system isn't built on the right foundations, which means it can never strive 
uh, in our world in that sense. And I think my concern is that you just mentioned fantasy. <laughs> the next fantasy that people are getting into is the metaverse. So you have the crypto world with the metaverse in a complete fantasy. And I'm very concerned about what's happening to civil society as a consequence. And I think that is something that has to be, in my mind, absolutely center stage for politicians as well as regulators. And therefore, I hope that in the US and in other markets, politicians are going to rein in to the extent that they protect humankind as opposed to the opposite. So thank you very much for an absolutely enlightened conversation to Professor, D uh, Professor Stephen and to John. Thanks. Thank you.